All right, we're going to take you back to 1963 when the landscape of sports was quite different. There were no major professional teams in the South, no Carolina Panthers, no Atlanta Braves, no Miami Dolphins. College sports, they were everything, and they were all white, pillars of a segregated society, but all that was about to change. Thanks to a Washington, D.C. native who dared to play where no African American had played before. Just so you know, there's some explicit language in this piece that we decided was critical to the story, so we kept it in. David Lee reports. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. On August 28, 1963, a quarter of a million people stood here outside the Lincoln Memorial to share Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of racial equality. One of those was 19-year-old Darrell Hill, a D.C. native ready to play his own role in the civil rights movement. The 60s was a very heady time. It was an emergence. Blazing trails came naturally to Hill. He was the first African-American football player at Gonzaga High School in D.C and the first at Navy as well, starring alongside Roger Staubach on an undefeated freshman team in 1961. But Hill decided the academy wasn't for him, and he was surprised when Lee Corso, then an assistant coach at the University of Maryland, came to recruit him. Head coach Tom Nugent was looking to integrate the Terrapins all-white football team. An African-American had never played in the Atlantic Coast Conference. I was being courted by, you know, the usual suspects in the North, you know, Penn State, Michigan State, you know, Syracuse, uh, and Corso shows up. And he says, uh, yeah, well, we want you to consider coming to Maryland. And I said, well, you forgot what conference you're in, didn't you? <laughs> but Hill eventually relented, agreeing to break the color barrier in the ACC. Though he didn't aspire to be another Jackie Robinson, he realized that he was the right person at the right time. It did occur to me, you know, somebody said that you don't have an option here. You're the right guy and you owe it to your, your race and your people to do this. It may be another two or three years before they bring another black forward. Initially, the Maryland faithful didn't welcome Hill with open arms. But in his fifth game against Air Force, he scored the game-winning touchdown as time expired and the hometown fans grew to appreciate his abilities. Hill also found a kindred spirit in teammate Jerry Fishman, the team's only Jewish player. When Daryl and I got together, he being the only black in the whole school almost, and me being the only Jewish football player, uh, one of the few to ever play at Maryland, we both had a natural uh, bonding uh, inclination. We both knew what it was like. Fishman was a big tough guy. You know, he was a middle linebacker, had a mean streak in him. He was big and athletic. Uh, and he was quick, you know, to step in the face of racism, you know, whether it be, you know, anti-Semitism or, or against, you know, African-Americans. And, uh, you know, there were a number of incidents where he, you know, reacted violently in some cases, you know, to certain racial incidents. I mean, I, I, one day we were in a, down in Durham in a five and dime. I said, are you going to serve us? And they said, uh, we don't serve niggers in here. And I said, well, we don't eat them. So how about uh, just a couple of sodas? Fishman got the team up and he was captain, moved everybody out, said, let's go. And then he went down the counter and knocked every dish <laughs> and saucer and glass into the floor, you know. Of course, there was a big hubbub about that, and the team had to chip in to pay for the dishes, but, you know, it was worth it. On the road in the ACC, Hill was the subject of constant racial abuse from opposing fans. An incident at Clemson caused Hill to walk off the field before the game even started. Somewhere along the line, one of the managers comes and gets me, takes me to the side gate. There's my mother standing out there. They wouldn't let her in the stadium. She had a ticket. You know, but they wouldn't, they didn't admit blacks. The blacks had to watch the game outside the stadium on a dirt hill called Nigger Hill, you know, I'll never will forget that. And uh, so she couldn't come, couldn't come in and it, it, it was homecoming. There was 50,000 drunk, you know, southern gentlemen just, just waiting. <laughs> 
and uh, I said, "Now nah, this is this is too volatile a situation. You know, I need to." I went back in the locker room, put my uniform, put my clothes back on. Somehow, the president of Clemson, the chancellor, gets wind of this and comes down, takes my mother to his box. And so I entered the game. When I got dressed again, the game had started. Although opposing fans were openly hostile towards him, Hill says opposing players generally weren't. And one player in particular earned Hill's undying gratitude with an unforgettable gesture of friendship. His name was Brian Piccolo, whose friendship with African-American running back Gail Sayers was immortalized in the movie Brian's Song. The Wake Forest fans were particularly nasty. <laughs> And they had organized racial cheers, you know, and this was going on in the pregame. And Piccolo just comes over and puts his arms around my shoulder and, and walks me toward the Wake Forest cheering section. Boy, and, you know, that just cut everything off. And then you got to remember, I mean, he was their greatest hero, the best football player that ever played at Wake. You know, he was like all everything. And he ran a risk of doing that time of being ostracized for be befriending an African American. That that was not acceptable behavior. So uh, you know, I never saw him again. But you know, every time I see the movie, you know, I get a little tear in my eye because the guy really was what he looked like in that movie, at least in, from my perspective. Hill wasn't the first African American ever to play against some of the ACC schools. Occasionally teams went north and faced teams with African-American players. But he was the first to invade their turf. And to Hill, that's the reason he faced so much resistance while integrating the ACC. Football in the South was, was a religion. And the football arenas and stadiums were the temples where they practiced this religion and worshiped this god of football. And so they saw me as a Negro back in those days, as they called us, as desecrating their temple. You know, so it was more of my playing on the field than playing against their players. It was the field, it was the stadium that was at issue here. By stepping foot in those stadiums and refusing to back down in the face of bigotry, Daryl Hill changed the landscape of college athletics forever. People don't even realize how the significance of it. Um, there were no black football players in the South. Uh, uh, Michael Jordan and all these great black athletes, they eventually would have played. But Darrell was the first one to open that door, and it wasn't easy. Football, like I said, in the South uh, was you know, was very important institution. So I think you know by integrating football, I helped move things in a positive direction. You know, quicker than maybe if I had not played football. So that's the legacy that I look back on. I'm happy to have just watched that story I because I, it's hard for us. We're younger than that generation mm -hmm. to actually understand what it was like. My parents graduated high school in 1962. I can't envision a world without, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or fully without, without it like it is today, right. basically. Yeah. And that's all that we know. So it's important to have stories like this yeah. out there. Yeah, thank you, David Lee. Yeah, Great absolutely. Job. And Brian Brennan, who put that together mm -hmm. in the back. And Maryland also took the lead in integrating ACC basketball, by the way. Billy Jones broke that barrier in 1965. The following year, the Southeastern Conference finally integrated SEC football and basketball integrated in the SEC in 1967. And that was just one season after Adolph Rupp's all-white Kentucky Wildcats team lost in the championship to a Texas Western squad featuring five African American starters. You probably saw that story in the movie Glory Road. So I once again, there's a correlation there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> excellent job, and thanks to David Lee and Brian Brennan for bringing us that story. Now, speaking of controversial basketball coaches, from Adolph Rupp <laughs> to Bob Knight. Tonight was a huge night for Mr. Knight, or was it? Love him or hate him, Knight had a chance to rewrite the record books tonight. We've got highlights after this. <laughs>